Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline, columnist for the News and Observer, he is Luke DeCock. And last night I texted you, man, <laughs> hope the Canes give us something to talk about tomorrow. And sure enough, the captain, this is why he's the captain. Jordan Stahl came through in the clutch, but not in the way that I thought. After a 3-1 loss to the Philadelphia Flyers, Jordan Stahl, is, as you wrote in the paper, he was he was ready. He, he was waiting. So before we get into it, here is uh, here is Jordan Stahl after the game talking about a lack of buy-in for the team so far this season. As a group, this doesn't look like we've completely bought into how we want to do things, and it's gonna it's gonna look like that. It's gonna be a 500 club that kind of wins some games and just kind of hold home, and then it's starting to get a little frustrating. And um, we're gonna need to have everyone, um, you know, I got to be better. Our lines gotta be better. We gotta contribute from everyone and um you know it's it's gotta start uh, start soon so again that was jordan stall after a 3-1 loss and luke you followed up with the the inconsistency of it all they look great against tampa and then they do that against philly so what the hell's going on i well let's start with the the micro here of, of jordan stall choosing to speak like this after the flyers game so when you've covered this league for a long time that hockey's a little bit of a different kind of sport the captain has a different kind of role there is a rhythm and sort of a um procession to this type of deal jordan stall is sitting at his locker when we get into the locker room he has something to say this is a very hockey thing the captain is making a pronouncement you saw ron francis do this you saw rod brindamore do this you saw justin williams do this and now you're seeing jordan stall do it so if you've been around this league for a long time can i you pause you right there you didn't say eric stall uh, Eric Stahl would too. I'm thinking more of the captains of the winning team. No, I know what you mean. I know exactly yeah. what you and, mean. And, and look, before Justin Williams was captain, when he didn't have this pulpit, he and I would talk in the hallway and he would say things like this because he couldn't really say it for everybody because he wasn't the captain. But if you went back in the archives and looked at like the 17, 18 season or whichever, yeah, the 17, 18 season, Justin Williams was saying a lot of these same things. He just didn't have this bully pulpit. So mm -hmm. There is this is very ceremonial. This is there's a lot of pomp and circumstance here. So that means what Jordan Stahl said should be freighted with this incredible significance more than comments after he's not frustrated after a loss. This was a very calculated performance designed to send a specific message. And the message is we play a very specific way. Some of you guys have gotten away from that and want to play all to quote Jim Rutherford, fancy Dan. That's not going to work for us. We are not a high skill team. We are a get the puck forward get the puck in, get apply pressure to other teams. That's how we're successful. That's what made us successful last year. It's what made us successful the year before and so on and so on. So this is a come to Jesus moment for the Hurricanes. Our players like Martin Natchez going to stop diddling with the puck and get the thing in and shoot it, which look, Tavo Teravainen, offender number one most years, has been great at that this year. Um, but it's not just one guy. It becomes a collective thing. You could see it last night when they were down 3 nothing. Uh, passing instead of shooting, uh, as Jordan said, all the twirling and whirling in the neutral zone. It's not their game, right? Their game is not sideways. It is straightforward. It is direct. And he and look, I mean, I give credit to Jordan Stahl. This reminds me of the time when Bill Peters ripped the team and kind of stole the column I'd already filed. <laughs> He's right. This is not the game that fans come to see. And they were yeah. booing at the end. He knew it. They knew it. Everybody knows it. So you and I have had this conversation over the last two months. The Hurricanes are in this motivational dead zone. It's hard to get up for these games when you know you're going to be there anyway. This is Jordan Stahl's message to the team saying, hey, we all know this. Mm -hmm. but we got to get our act together before it's too late because we are starting to get out of the motivational dead zone and into the actual danger zone because this is not a high margin league. You can screw things up pretty easily. Hurricanes are a better team than this. They have to get back to playing what makes them good because this ain't it. Yeah, and this gets to my curiosity about the deficiencies of this group so far, and some of it is motivational. I think you and I are both in agreement on that. But some players that you're expecting to step up simply haven't, and I'm starting to wonder, for instance, Peter Kochekov, right? Go Goaltending has been an overall problem for the team, and it's not just one guy. Everybody's had their off nights. But Kochekov, we're just a couple years removed where I was on the radio saying, hey, man, if this guy is your future, hand the rain, you know, hand it over to him. He's the young Ruski. Here we go. They finally got this goalie. But I almost feel like there's been a regression with Kochekov. I don't know if that regression is because of the weird and wonky minor league drama that the Canes have. Or it could just be the simplest answer. Goaltending is voodoo. 
and he's kind of going through it right now. And it was, look, you can't be giving up goals 50 seconds in like that. No. That was a problem last night. It was a nasty shot, but you got you got to be bigger. You got to stop that. Yeah. Um. You know, he's, he's he's in some ways he's kind of become Peter the puck dodger, sort of making himself small at times. When you look back to this time a year ago, when he basically came in and saved the Hurricanes' bacon, mm-hmm. you know, he was he looked like he was six six. Um. He's not playing that way right now. And look, yes, goalies have high variance. You look at Kochekov before New Year's last year and after New Year's last year, he was like two different goalies. Yeah. Um, and certainly you've seen that with Antti Ranta. We've seen that with Frederick, a- Frederick Anderson. Lord knows we saw it with Peter Morozik. You Sometimes you just never know what you're going to get from season to season, month to month, night to night. That said, Hurricanes goaltending hasn't been good enough. Everybody knows it. But this is typically a team that we've seen over the last five years. If it's playing the right way, can play through that. And some of what you're seeing, and you saw this last night, you saw it on the West Coast especially, when you give up an early goal or two, you've got to stick to the game plan. It worked in San Jose, but last night they got away from it. So that's part of the message here. If you want to read something into Jordan Stahl's words, although I don't think you need to. I mean, no, I he, don't need basically, to. He, he, he basically came out and, you know, there's no there's no beating around the bush here. But our goaltending isn't good enough right now. We can't change our game because of that. We just got to keep plugging. We'll get goals if we play our way, and we'll stop giving up these terrible goals. Look, last the second and third goals last night, our defensive zone breakdowns. You'd love to see Kachekov make a save, mm-hmm. but he's helpless on those. He's he's flailing. And at the other end, Jack Drury has the same chance that the Flyers scored two goals on, basically, and he fluffs it right into Carter Hart's belly. He's still on zero for the season. Jordan Martinuk is still on zero for the season. Svech has an excuse, but he's still on zero for the season. Yeah, he's only played eight games so far coming off the injury. And Jordan yeah. Stahl, I know he's accountable too, but and I'm not, I'm not asking Jordan Stahl to go out there and be a prolific goal scorer, but... Usually, if things are cooking, Stahl's going to get on the board on a yeah. His His knee pads do. There's no question about <laughs> it. His, his right shin is overdue. Like, and he hasn't scored since the opener. So right, that right. said, his line, which was put back together last night after being briefly broken up, Stahl, Martin, uh, Jesper Foss, is one of the best lines in the NHL possession-wise. So mm-hmm. to me, they're the third slash fourth line, 3A, 4A, whatever you want to call it. They're doing their job even though they're not scoring. You can send them out, and they'll shut down the opposition's top line. They'll control the puck. At this point in Stahl's career, Martinuk's career, Foss' career, I I think that's a fair expectation. The question is, can the Ajo line score more? Can the Kokiemi line score more? Can they get anything out of this fourth line with Jack Drury and two random characters? Um, That, to me, is emerging, actually, as one of the biggest weaknesses of the season is you don't have that fourth line you had last year with Derek Stepan and, and... Paul Stastny that was giving you goals. This fourth line is not helping you. And when you throw in the issues with the third pairing, because Rod Brindamore is going to play Tony D'Angelo over Jalen Chatfield because God told him to or something, that's going to continue to be an issue. That line was, you know, was on the on the ice for two goals last night, or that pairing, excuse me, was on the ice for two goals last night. And I really believe that Jalen Chatfield is a better fit with Dimitri Orlov than Tony mm-hmm. D'Angelo. But Tony's got to play for some reason. Tony's got to play, but can Tony get traded? I mean, I'm not. I mean, I know I was out of town and kind of out of pocket for a little bit, but are there Tony D'Angelo trade rumors? Are there, there were trade rumors. Yeah, no, there were. I mean, the Hurricanes were talking very seriously uh, about a deal with the Minnesota Wild for Kalen Addison, who's a young sort of offensive defenseman who had trouble finding a role in Minnesota. Uh, San Jose stepped in and made a better offer, and that's and there's not a lot of interest in Tony D'Angelo otherwise. So well, I yeah. think right now the Hurricanes are going to let Tony sit. He knows that. You know, that Elliot Friedman talked about it on the hockey night. He knows that deal was out there being talked about. Does that light a fire under his butt and get him playing better on his own end? Is he capable of playing better on his own end? The flip side is he made two terrific plays last night, one that led to a goal, one that should have led to a goal. He's kind of doing his thing. He's mm-hmm. going to be good in one end and not so great in the other. When the rest of the team is struggling to play its game, all of Tony D'Angelo's sort of faults are magnified. So maybe... I don't want to put everything on Tony D'Angelo. He's in a tough spot because the way he plays and the way the Hurricanes are playing, his mistakes are going to be magnified right now. When they are more in their groove, like they were in Tampa, then Tony D'Angelo fits and everything seems to work. Do they make a move in net? I mean, I'm I'm not exactly a capologist, but the impression that I get is that Peter Kochekov's deal is relatively team-friendly in the long run. Is that something that they can envision going and getting a more veteran presence in net, not a Halak situation as Frederick Anderson is out? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I don't think so at this point. That may be something that they look at closer to the trade deadline if goaltending remains a concern. Mm-hmm. And I think they still feel pretty good about a healthy Frederick Anderson 
and Antti Ranta when he's not forced to play two out of every three games. Yeah. Um, that's a formula that's worked. It actually was working before Anderson had this blood clotting thing mm -hmm. come up again. So um, I, I think the other part of it is in the big, big picture beyond the season, Peter Kachekov needs to play. He yeah. needs reps. And as frustrating as it is to watch the team struggle and give up these goals and have the captain spout off like this, which I, I say spout off, but I'm 100% on his side here. And Rod, so was Rod Brindamore for that matter. I mean, he basically said, well, he knows it. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. bother playing. I didn't even bother playing the Brindamore cuts. Right. He's basically going, yeah, what Jordan said. Yeah. And, 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 and to the end, to that point, like it's time for me to get tougher because clearly the message isn't getting through. Mm -hmm. But I think even with all of that, Hurricanes are still in a good position. I mean, they've lost once at home. They're nine and seven. They can get on one good hot streak and the season's, you know, you can put it in the bag and worry about it later. So there is some value to getting Peter Kachekov reps right now, even when the team's playing badly, because if he bails them out of a game like last night, which he didn't, yeah, maybe he gets some confidence. Maybe everyone gets some momentum. It's going to happen eventually. He's too talented of a goalie to keep letting in crappy goals. And as I said, the first one last night's not a great goal. He's not very big in his net, but it was a nasty shot. And sometimes those do get through. But I, I think this is all fixable. And I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to let Kachekov kind of struggle through this and see if he can figure it out. Luke Takat, Comnus News and Observer. We appreciate the time as always. We will talk to you. My guess is we'll talk to you after Thanksgiving as we yeah. uh, will see. I mean, it's going to hey. be the interesting Dave Doran, Mac Brown fest. And one of us may be calling plays for the Panthers by then. I tried. I mean, we've already covered a good chunk of the Panthers conversation today. I, I, I it's funny. I, I wanted to talk about a, a good professional franchise in the state of North Carolina, and the Canes can't even give me that right now. I mean, come on, guys. I, there's I, I, honestly, there's nothing left to say about the Panthers. There, there really just is. isn't, other than you can see the owners' fingerprints over all over this franchise in every way. And that ain't a good thing. So one of these days, and maybe he'll do it on the McAfee show, but I want Frank Reich to go on the McAfee show and say, yeah, man, I thought working for Jim Irsay was kind of crazy. He'll, do it. It. He'll, he'll go on with the Mannings next year after when he's out of a job. And it'll be like the Manning cast with Frank Reich, and he'll just blast the entire Panthers organization <laughs> for an entire quarter. Oh, man. So good. So good. He has the look of a man who bought a car. That's a lemon. <laughs> 